Hi, my name is Frank Collada. I was born in Chicago in 1938. From the mid-1950s through the early 1970s, I was a criminal in Chicago. I started out as a juvenile thief and then graduated to burglary, robbery, arson, sometimes murder. I became associated to the Chicago outfit and a close friend of Tony Splacho's. What you heard next is my story. Entirely in my own words, I tell it all. When you are finished listening, you'll know the inside story of what it was like to be a career criminal in Chicago and the real Tony Splacho. You may or may not like me very much after you've finished, but that's okay. What you do want to know, though, is that everything you hear me say is true, and I'm telling it just the way it happened. In part two, you will hear about the 70s and the 80s in Las Vegas. I'll start this uh, story out in my early years. I was probably about eight or nine years old, and I started hearing a lot of stories about my father. And I had a godfather also that was a, a dapper type guy. He wore a fedora and a top coat. And he was a state representative in the city of Chicago. He had a lot of clout. Uh, this I learned and seen by the people that associated with him, but I never knew that he was uh, crooked, let's say. His name was Rocky, and that's all you need to really know. And my godmother's name was uh, Francis, and as I said, you're not going to hear the last names. And they had one child, a daughter. My mother always said good things about my father. She never really let me know what type of a man he was. It was only later after my father died or was killed in an automobile accident that I realized that my father was, let's say, a criminal, a crook, a killer, a gangster, whatever you chose to think. He was probably all of these things, but he was still my father. I used to hear from my cousins, certain parts of my other family, his friends, Policemen, everybody, what kind of a guy he was, what a stand-up guy he was. Not mind you, I'm just a kid at the time, maybe 10, 11 years old. And they're telling me that he was known for his driving abilities. He was a wheel man, a wheel man. He used to drive the work car with his cruel crooks and criminals, and he used to go out pulling robberies, stick-ups, burglaries, whatever. And uh, he was supposedly the best at his uh, trade. As far as being a wheel man, he got him away from everything. I used to idolize him, even as a kid before I knew these things. And then when I started hearing all these stories about him, I really started idolizing him. So my road in life was actually starting to be cut out for me already. And there was no turning back. By the time I hit 12 or 13, I already knew I wanted to be just like my father. No matter what my mother or anybody would tell me, I wanted to be just like him. And, uh, you know, I got in trouble as a kid, and they say, you could never be the man your father was, so why don't you wake up and stuff like that. That even made me try harder to be like him. My father had a, a very, very violent temper, and uh, I used to see him holler at my mother and chase her around. I never seen him strike her, but I used to see him throw things at her if things weren't to his liking in the house. One particular day, my father, my aunt, his, that's his sister, and myself went to the cemetery to see our, my grandparents. On the way back, we're driving on North Avenue, and a car pulled alongside of us, and one of the guys spit out the window. Now, I don't know if it was intentional or what, but my father took it personally, and he curbed the car. North Avenue is a pretty wide street. And he ran over there, and he pulled one guy out of the car, and he threw him on the ground, and he started punching him. The other guy got out of the car and ran over there to help his buddy, and my father kicked his ass too. And he kept on beating on him. So finally, uh, my aunts pulled him off of these guys, and he jumped in the car, and, we, and he took off. And the police came, so he lambed them, you know, I mean, that was a chase, a little bit of a chase. And uh, he got away. And we got back to uh, our, my, you know, our apartment. 
I do remember another time I seen my father uh, get crazy in the house. I came home with a bad report card, and my mother got all nervous. She says, if your father sees this, he's going to kill you. So she had the report card. He came in the house, and uh, about an hour later, he says, uh, let me see his report card. And she said, I don't know where it's at, Joe. Well, he started looking, and he found a report card. So he started chasing me, and I went and I dove underneath the bed. And he was screaming, and he said, i get you, I'll pull you out of there. And he started to lift the bed up. My sister ran in there, and she said, Daddy, don't hit him. And he turned around, and he chased her, and he kicked her, and she flew down the stairs. Well, actually, she saved me probably from a beating. But I knew at the time I was still his favorite, but I was still scared because I seen his violent temper. My mother couldn't stop him. Nobody could stop him when he was mad. Anyway, he just forgot about me because he thought, uh, uh, well, he got it out of his system by taking it out of my sister. Thank God it wasn't me. You know, I want to tell you a little something about my mother. I had a good mother, very legitimate. She was, uh, every, she, everybody should have a mother like I had. She was always on her kid's side. She was good to my father. She, she took care of the house. Uh, typical Italian woman looking out for her husband. That was the only thing that mattered to her. And he was very jealous. She couldn't look at a guy. Uh, even glance, he'd go crazy. Every year there was new furniture in our house. I never knew where he got that furniture until my later years. And I come to find out in later years that he used to rob these furniture stores and bring all the furniture home. And uh, it didn't cost him none. But every year we had all this wonderful furniture. One day my mother dropped one of these statues. It was a horse. I never forget it. And he come in and he happened to see that the horse's head wasn't there. And he went nuts. I mean, he threw the statue at her, and she she left him. She took us kids and left him for uh, a day, but he tracked her down by his by her sister's house. And uh, we had to take a streetcar to get there. And he knew that she had nowhere to go other than her sister's. So he started banging on the doors, and this her sisters lived around Grand and Ogden, which is quite a distance away from where we were living. And uh, she says, I'm not opening up the door for you, Joe. And he kicked the door open and kicked her sister. And he ran in the house and he got us and he took all of us back home. And he told her, her sister, you never take my wife out of my house again or cover her, make a, you know, conceal her from me because I'll kill you and your husband. I got to tell you about another uh, robbery my father pulled, and I heard about uh, in later years. Uh, it was the Chicago Tribune. Him and his uh, partners, they stuck it up. And I think at the time they got about 60000 or 80000 I don't know. You hear different stories, but I know it was a large amount of money. For them days, it was an enormous amount of money. And uh, I came from, uh, I, I think it was one of them kindergarten schools or something. And I uh, came in the house, and there was a guy sitting by the front door in a chair. And uh, he says, hello. And I said, hello. And I walked in, and I asked my mother, who is he? She says, he's watching the house for us. And this guy hung around there for four days. And, but he kept on changing. It kept on being another guy there every day. Different guy. So finally, after the fourth day, and I didn't see my father, and I couldn't understand why this guy just kept on sitting there. So uh, he, after the fourth day, he left, and then my father showed up. And uh, I sort of remember him saying that uh, to my mother that the witness didn't show up for something. And then, I, as I said, later on, I found out that uh, he pulled this uh, robbery at the Chicago Tribune. i like to clarify the neighborhood I lived in at the time that these uh, people were sitting in our house, the neighborhood was Grand and Ogden. It's on the east side of Chicago. Our neighbor at that time was Tony Accardo, uh, wound up being the head of the Chicago Syndicate. He lived in the front house. 
in them days they had a house in front on the street and then they had a house in back towards the alley we lived in the one in the back towards the alley and I want to get back to my uh, godfather Rocky Rocky as I said was a state representative well he he helped my father beat that case because he had a lot of clout and of course as I said the witness didn't show up so they threw the case out with the help of uh, my godfather Rocky Anyway, let me get back to a couple more stories. My uh, father, what I found out about my father as far as his life of crime. I was told by uh, a few people that uh, he knew John Dillinger. And uh, John Dillinger pulled a jewel robbery. Well, John Dillinger was known for robbing banks. So when he pulled his jewel robbery, full of jewelry, I should say, he came to my father, and he wanted to know if my father had a connection to get rid of the jewelry. Well, my father most naturally told him yes, and my father had bad intentions. So he had Dillinger meet him at this warehouse, and when he came with the jewelry, my father and his friends, they they robbed him. They took the jewelry from John Dillinger and run him out of there. And uh, John Dillinger couldn't do much about it, and he just went on and kept on robbing banks. That's what I guess until he got killed. The head of the the head guy in the black hand, his name was Frank Bonavento, and he was in charge of all these grease balls. And one time they put a uh, a thing on my our door, our house, you know. We lived in Grand and Ogden. There was a uh, black hand, just like somebody stuck their hand in ink and put it on the door. That means that they wanted some money. Well, my father was like enraged. He went crazy. As a kid, like I said, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I did see the sign. But in the later years, I found out all about it. Uh, I was told by his friends that uh, this Frank Bonavento and his wife went in hiding uh, because they knew that these young up-and-coming outfit guys were like taking over and uh, this Frank Benevento was uh, in a motel room hiding out with his wife and a couple guys busted in the door and they uh, shot him in the shot him to death in the bed alongside of his wife they didn't touch her and they left now I was told later on that this was my father so he sort of ended that black hand era that was going on in the neighborhood then and became like a hero. But yet, he didn't want to be involved in the up-and-coming outfit. He wanted to be his own man, and he didn't, just didn't believe in any working with a bunch of guys and taking orders. So he uh, stood with his crew, and they operated uh, independently the outfit. Although he was connected, he still operated independently of the outfit. I got to tell you, I do remember the night my father was killed. We were supposed to go to my cousin's house, younger cousins, and I was looking forward to that because they were my age and uh, we were going to go there and I had somebody to play with. And uh, he was supposed to get home about 6 at night. And we were waiting, and 6 came, and he didn't show up. 7 came, and he didn't show up. My mother started going back and forth to the phone. And I was moaning as a kid would moan, where's daddy, where's daddy? And she says, he'll be home, he'll be home. But she kept on going to the telephone. And the phone would ring, and she'd call again. And finally got to be 9 o'clock, and she says, well, your father got tied up in some business. He won't be home, so you'll see him in the morning. So the following morning, uh, when I did wake up, there was a bunch of people in the house, and uh, she was sitting in a chair, and she was crying. And uh, she, they brought me over to her, and she says, I need to tell you something. And I looked up at her, and she says, Your father is not coming back to us. He's in heaven, so you won't be seeing him no more. I do remember that, and uh, everybody was still crying, and of course I didn't know what death was at that time. 
I did know what violence was, but I just couldn't imagine him never coming again. So I handled it as a child. I cried, you know, probably cried because I was selfish. I don't know, but I cried. I know I missed him. I guess I forgot to mention how my father was killed uh, the day I was waiting for him. And my, we were supposed to go by a cousin's house. He uh, was lambing. In other words, it was a chase. And the Oak Park police were uh, chasing him in his car. And uh, he hit a, He went through a light, a stoplight, probably. They said he was doing about 80. And he hit a, a bus that transported people around. And uh, the car climbed up the side of the bus and flipped over backwards and forward a couple times. This is according to the, the policeman. And his arm fell out of the, his arm dangled out of the window and at that moment some guy was going through the light. The light was green on one side. My father went through the red and uh, hit my father in his door and that's what killed him instantly. Well, the car that my father was driving was under a fictitious name, and uh, they didn't, and he had no identification on him to indicate that he was Joe Collada. So they had him in the morgue, and uh, they had the car in the impound. So when my mother was waiting and talking to all his friends on the phone, they went out and started looking around and checking on different police stations and come to find out that uh, one of them had, there was an accident in the suburbs, Oak Park was considered a suburb, and uh, the name of the owner of the car's name was uh, Joe Sperling, or Sterling, or something like that, well then they knew right away that that was the work car, then they got a hold of my mother, and uh, she went with them, and they identified him, got the police report on it. They could hardly believe that this is the way he died because of the fact that he was such a good driver. I want to get back to my younger years as a kid. I wasn't very good at school. I hated school. I had a learning problem. And I got bored real quick. And uh, I just couldn't get along. And of course I had these thick eyeglasses. And kids are mean when you're a kid. And at the time, glasses were not stylish. So I had to fight all the time because of these thick glasses that I wore. And I became, and I got a reputation as being a tough guy. Of course, I just fought out of anger. I never really thought I was a tough guy, but I won all them fights because I was so mad and probably scared. Anyway, as I said, I was having a lot of problems in school, so my mother thought by sending me to of I went to Catholic school, and the nuns used to beat me with the rulers, and, and then I was muscling all the kids for their milk money, and I was like a, a tyrant in the school, you know. So the, the nuns didn't want me no more, and they told her. So she says, well, I'll, and they told her, well, he'd be good in a trade school with his hands. So she sent me to the school uh, called Orr Vocational. It was a public school. So I went to the school. There was a lot of kids in there just like me, troubled. I had a hard time uh, understanding what somebody was telling us. We had a learning problem. Right now, I guess they got a name for it, but then there was no such thing as it. Anyway, uh, in the principal there, his name was Mr. Jones. He was a mean man. Of course, principals were tough in them days. That's what they were. That's why they were principals. And he didn't like the way we wore our pants. You know, the kids nowadays wore them the same way we wore them then, down low. And he'd say, pull them up. And when you didn't pull them up, he'd pull them up for you. And uh, it sort of hurt when he pulled them up too high. Fire went up to your crotch. So one day I'm walking down the hall and he uh, took me and he put me, uh, told me he needed to talk to me. And I went to the bathroom with him. And when we went in the bathroom, he slapped me and tried to pull my pants up. Well, I need him. And when I need him in his crotch, he doubled over. And I, then I need him in his face and his head at the, the rack that was in there. And I ran out of the toilet, out of the restroom. I was scared. 
Well, he didn't say nothing about it. I guess he was he knew he was wrong for uh, bringing me in his room and uh, doing what he'd done. Well, a couple other guys and myself figured we were going to retaliate on this guy. So uh, we waited one day till recess, and we had a, a blanket that we took out of the, the gym, gymnasium. And as he was walking past our, our, our school room, we threw the blanket over his head, and we had some rope. We already knew what we were going to do to him. And we took him in the classroom. He was struggling, but we had him all tied up in his blanket. And we had his ankles tied up, and we hung him out of the window. And uh, we left. Of course, the police come. They pull him back in and everything. And somebody told that it was me and then these other two guys. And they got a hold of my mother, and they didn't put me in jail or anything, but they convinced my mother that uh, I should be sent to this, uh, this I, I call it a reformatory. It was called Prenel School, and it was in the city in, uh, off of Peterson Street, I believe. It was like 60 or 70 kids to a cottage, which was a house, a big house, and it had a, dom a dormitory upstairs. Then downstairs it had a game room. And it was like 75% black in there. So most naturally you're going to be fighting with blacks all day long because they didn't like white people. And they thought white people had money. I don't know why they thought that. I was in the same spot with them. Anyway, I went to the school for like three months and inside I stood there. My mother visited me faithfully every day. So I got out and then I needed, see, I was getting in so much trouble that she started taking my allowance away if I did things around the house. So I needed money, so I started stealing out of these paper bags. It was like on your honor back then. People would go buy a newspaper, they throw a nickel in there, take the paper out. Well, the bag would be full of nickels, and I'd shimmy up the pole and steal all the nickels out. This went on for a while, and finally one day uh, the guy that had this route seen me and started chasing me. Well, that was the end of uh, robbery, stealing from the paper bag. So I decided to uh, go on a shoe shine route and start shining shoes. So I made myself a little uh, wooden box, and I went up and down the street called Grand Avenue, and I started shining shoes, going by different saloons and shining these drunks' shoes. They'd give me a quarter or dime or whatever. And about two weeks went by, and I bumped into this guy who was on the other side of the street, and he yelled at me, get off my fucking turf. And I looked at him, and I said, I don't see your name on any signs. We met in the middle of the street, Grand Avenue again. And he grabbed me, and I grabbed him, and we started screaming at each other. And he said, if I see you tomorrow, I'm breaking your head. I said, well, I'll be here tomorrow. He said, what's your name? And I told him, Frank Collada. And he said, well, I'll be back tomorrow, and if I see you, I'm going to break your head. I said, I'll be here. So I didn't see this guy for like a week. I did go back every day, shining my shoes. Shining shoes, I should say. And then uh, one day I seen him, and he called me, and uh, we met again, but not in the middle of the street. And he asked me, what's your father's first name? I said, what are you doing, writing a book? He said, no, don't get smarties. I need to know. It's really important. So I says, his name is Joe. His name was Joe. And he says, you know, my father and your father were very good friends. He says, my father's name was Patsy Splacho. And I says, so? He says, well, your father saved my father's life. Took the black hand. At that time... Back in the earlier days, it wasn't the syndicate or the outfit. They were called the Black Hand. They were a bunch of greaseballs from Italy that were muscling their own kind for protection. And they were going around the neighborhoods, and they were muscling all the immigrants, all the old Italians that had restaurants and barber shops and taking a portion of their money. So this Patty, Patsy Spalaccio looked a little upset one day. He had this Russian, and my father said, what's the matter, Patsy? And he said, well, they got these, the black hand, they're coming around here, he says, and they're uh, muscling me. And he said, what day did they come around? And Patsy told him. He said, well, I'll be here next Thursday, ignore me. 
He says, you got a back room here? And he said, yeah. Well, from what I found out later is that my father and a couple of his friends went in the back room. And then when these uh, grease balls come in to muscle Pat, Patsy, he gave them their money. And then my father and his guys came out and they whacked these guys. They uh, killed them. And uh, nobody muscled Patsy anymore. Well, Tony told me that story. And uh, he told me that his father says, I want you to be friends with this guy. No matter what, he's going to be your friend forever because his father saved my life. That's how I met Tony. How I really learned how to steal cars, my mother had a 46 Mercury floor shift. And uh, when she used to get home from work, she was a, a waitress. She used to park the car and... I learned how to drive already by watching her. So she used to hide her keys. At first I used to take her keys. Then she started hiding her keys. So I got in the car one day and I crawled underneath the dashboard and I was looking at the ignition. And I had the cellophane that, uh, that goes with your back of your cigarettes, tinfoil. And I uh, rolled it up in a ball and that's stuck it in between the ignition the poles back there, and it started the car. So now I knew how to steal cars. So uh, I was taking her car, and one particular day, I'll never forget it, is uh, I, I threw the transmission. And uh, actually, lucky for me, when it went out, it was near my house. So I had to push it with, a, with the guy that was with me for like a half a block or a block, and when we got there, some jerk had already taken the spot where my mother was parking. So I had to break the window on the car and release the emergency brake on this other car and push that out of the way so I could push my mother's car back in that spot so she wouldn't know. Then I'm thinking, what happens when she gets in the car and the car don't move? She's going to wonder, how the hell did the trance go out of her? She didn't know nothing about transmissions, but I figured I'd add her kind. Well, uh, she never did know. She couldn't figure it out until about 20 years later I told her, and then she started beating me on the head with her shoes. You know, uh, I forgot to tell you, after this parental school, I had to go back to school again. So I had to go to the school. It was called Montefiore, and it was on the south side of Chicago. And uh, it was quite a distance from where we lived on Harlem and Grand. And the only way to get there was with streetcars or steal a car. So uh, when I got out of this uh, parental school, I had to attend the school. And not knowing the neighborhood, I didn't know what I was up against until on my first day in school. It was 98% black. And there was only 2% white, and uh, Tony was one of them, Splacho. So I met him at school, and I said, Jesus. And I said, we're like in a jungle over here. And he said, yeah. He says, you got to fight every day. I guess Tony was there a month before I got there, and he was fighting every day as it was. So uh, I told him, I said, shit, I ain't going to be taking a bus down here every day. I said, let me show you how to steal cars. He started laughing. How are you going to do it? Well, back in them days... That's all you needed was a roll of tinfoil, you stick it back at the ignition, and the car would start. It ground out the poles, and boom, the car would start. So we start, I start stealing the car, and we start driving to school every day and with stolen cars. And we were getting the fights. These black guys, they hated white people. And uh, one day I'm walking down the hall, I'm coming from Woodshop, and I see a, a bunch of them, and they're surrounding this short guy. And I look, and it's Tony. So I start running down the hall, and they started with Tony, one of the guys, and Tony started boxing with the guy. And the guy picked him up and threw him like, a, like nothing against the wall. Tony got up, and as he got up, I grabbed this big pole. These, they had these very large windows that you needed to pull, this long pole to shut them, to lift the window. So I grabbed the pole, and I swung at the crew of blacks that were there, and they started running, and Tony got up and he boxed the shit out of this guy. So we took off out of school. So I said, Tony, when we come back tomorrow, they're going to kill us over there. 
And he says, nah, he says, I'm going to tell my brother Vic. He says, I think we could take the, solve this problem. I said, all right. So the following day, Vic pulls up, and he's got this Mercury. I never forget it. He's got a big gun, 45. This is Tony and his brother Vic. Hop in, they said to me. I said, all right, I hop in the car. They said, we're going to go get the ringleader. This black guy, his name is Jackson. You know who he is. I said, yeah. I said, they'll all be in the cafeteria at this time. He said, yep, that's where we're going to get him. We're going to go in the cafeteria and take him out of there. So Vic whipped in a school uh, playground. It was a playground just before the cafeteria door. And Tony and I jumped out of the car, and we ran in the cafeteria. And there's Jackson sitting down with all these, all these black guys. And Tony's got the forty-five in his hand. And I grabbed Jackson by around the neck, chokehold, and I'm dragging him down the hallway. It wasn't very far that we had to go. And we yanked him, we pulled him in the car. We got him in the car and we pulled out the school uh, lot there, the playground, and all the blacks are out there screaming, but none of them, you know, attempting to really run after the car. And we take this Jackson and we start beating him, pistol whipping him in the car. And we give him a hell of a beating. Then we roll up in front of the yard and they're all standing around there, still mulling around, and we dumped them out of the car. Just like in the movies. We just roll him right out of the car and he tumbled. And we pull away. And I said, well, maybe we're either going to go to jail over this or uh, we're going to get killed tomorrow. What are you going to do? He said, I ain't coming back to school tomorrow. So I said, either am I. So the following day, I got arrested. Tony got arrested. And Tony, I went to St. Charles, which was a, another school that housed you. It was in St. Charles, Illinois, another school that was all black. But, of course, on my journey up there, I met a lot of guys through all these reformatories. So I had a lot of friends that I met in my criminal career, let's say. But Tony got out of it because he was going to work at his father's restaurant. So they made Tony, and they put him on probation to work with his father's restaurant, and I went to the St. Charles and of course, you had to work when you were in there, too. So between working and fighting, that's what I did in there. But nobody really messed with me anymore. And this same guy, Jackson, had come in there about six months later. I was in there six months already. And he came up to me, and he told all the blacks that uh, this is one crazy white man, white guy. He said, you better not mess with this dude. And he told him what happened, and I became like, you know, one of their guys, you know. And uh, I did nine months in there. And again, my mother visited me every week, every week. I got to tell you how, how actually I started into uh, sticking up places. There was this guy, uh, he was called Crazy Bob Sprodak. He was a tall, lanky guy, and uh, he was a loner. And he always carried a, a stick, that's a pistol. And uh, I hadn't gotten into stick-ups and stuff like that yet. You know, I was just a kid that was stealing cars, that stole cars. Anyway, I met this Bob Sprodak, and uh, I had glasses, as I said earlier, and uh, it was always a problem in my life. And he started with me on the street. So I uh, threw him down on the ground and was beating the shit out of him. And... Uh, I let him up after a while, and uh, we became friends. So uh, one day I was, I had a car. I was a, like one of the first guys in the neighborhood that had a car. And the money I got, how I got the car was my mother cashed in some uh, stocks that my father had left her. And uh, I had this Oldsmobile. It was a nice car. And Bob walked up to me, and he said, uh, he showed me this package of money. I said, wait, where'd you get all that money? He said, I stick up places. You want to come with me? And I said, nah. He says, that's, what do you do? And he said, well, I run in there and I put the gun down and I, if I got to shoot him, I shoot him. He said, but I run in all these taverns, gas stations, and I make this money. I said, I don't think I want to do stuff like that. Sounds a little stupid to me. He said, well, if you ever change your mind, let me know. He says, that's all. He's, I got everything, the guns, the gloves, he's the mask, if we need masks. Of course, we won't need them because we're kids, nobody knows us. He says, all we'll do is need to steal cars, and I know that you could steal cars good. So I let him go, and uh, 
he walked away and I uh, continued washing my car. I got to get back to Crazy Bob. When he approached me with these armed robberies that he wanted to do, I just had got hired by my mother's brother, Choppy. His name was Choppy. And uh, he got me a job at a newsstand, selling papers out of a newsstand, which was the thing that, the in, the in thing at that time. In other words, you had to have connections to work at a newsstand. I don't know why, but you had to have connections. Anyway, I got this job working downtown. So my uncle told me, listen, every once in a while a car is going to pull up and that one, you're going to have two cigar boxes. His one box is going to be for the newspapers you sell and another box is going to have money in there with little slips of paper. You don't need to pay attention to that box. Give that box to the guy who pulls up in the car and asks you for that box. And I said, okay. It was cold out there. And we had a 55-gallon drum, and there was a fire going on, you know, to keep warm. And this car would pull up maybe two or three times a day, and I'd hand him this box. So the box would fill up quite frequently. So I kept on thinking about Crazy Bob, and I said, there's got to be a better way to make a living than stand out there and freeze my ass off. So uh, the following day, I told my uncle, I said, you know what? I said, I don't want to do that no more. He said, no, you can't do that to me. you got to stay there. I stick the job in your ass. I'm leaving. I'm not going back there. It's too cold. So I left, and then I uh, looked up Crazy Bob, and I says, I'm ready. I'm ready. We'll do what you got to do. Let's uh, go out and stick up some taverns. And I got to tell you about my first uh, robbery, arm robbery. I hook up with this Crazy Bob. And he's, you know, you pick out a tavern just as you're driving down the street. You don't know what you're going into, whether it's light in there, dark in there, or what. So I tell Bob, I say, you know, you got masks? Nah, we don't need masks. Nobody knows us. I said, uh, well, I got to take my glasses off. I says, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to see if it's real dark. And don't worry, I got you covered. I said, all right. So he we had a sawed-off shotgun. He's got a sawed-off shotgun, and I got a pistol. Bust in the fucking door. He throws a blast in the air at the bar. Knocks all the bottles off the back shelf. Everybody get on the floor, he's screaming. So I'm yelling the same thing. Everybody get on the fucking ground. And people are all laying on the ground, right? Or laying on the floor there. And they're all laying here and there. And it was cold. And as I said, back in them days, everybody wore fedoras and uh, trench coats or top coats. So I'm looking. It's real dark in there. And I'm looking in the back, and I see somebody standing there. I said, what don't you know about getting down on the floor? And the guy don't say nothing. And I'm looking at the people closest to me, too, and they're looking at me like, who, the f who am I talking to? So I said, don't you understand what I'm saying? Get down on the floor right now. Bob's laughing. So I run back there, and it's a coat rack with a hat on it and a top coat. I was so fucking embarrassed. I knocked it over on the floor. Bob, we got the money. We ran out of there, and Bob was laughing. I said, what are you laughing? He said, oh, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. I said, Bob, you got to promise me you'll never tell anybody what happened in that tavern, or else I'll kill you. He said, no, nah, don't worry about it. I'll never tell nobody. Well, nobody knew about that until my first, uh, well, let's say the first time I wrote a book. And then I put it out there in the street. So everybody could know that I stuck up a coat rack. Well, right after that robbery, Bob, he uh, went, we used to stick up like two or three taverns a night and uh, maybe a gas station here or there and uh, probably make 500, you know. And we'd probably do that uh, three days a week. And... Uh, Mostly, you get in these taverns, you get a lot of uh, crazy Polack people. They love to drink, and they'd be in there, and uh, they much weren't too scared of you, you know. So you had to be careful what what lounges you went into. And uh, I made sure that everything we went into uh, had uh, it was lit up a little bit so I could see in there. Well, eventually, I just couldn't do it anymore with this guy, Bob, because uh, he was a lunatic. He'd... Uh, 
shoot people, he'd shoot up the place. Uh, he was very, very violent, and I knew that eventually he was going to kill somebody, and uh, we were going to wind up going to jail forever. So I slowly but surely uh, got away from him, but within that period of time, he did get busted for uh, some type of robbery. I forgot what it was, and he wound up going to jail for a little while, and this made me get away from him and hook up with uh, a couple other guys who I know by the name of uh, Dickie Gorman and Pauly Shiro. And uh, we continued uh, sticking up places. And uh, we had one very, very bad experience. We took this guy, Gino Chipetta, with us. And we went out to uh, this town, Cicero. It's where all the syndicate guys used to hang. And I told uh, the guys I was with, I said, we got to be careful in this town because we don't know who's going to be in this place or if this place is connected. And uh, they weren't quite worried about it, and I was a little worried about it. So one particular night after we, you know, we committed several robberies before we ran into this bad one, we went into this uh, saloon in uh, Cicero, and I was behind the wheel. And we had work cars, and we had the switch plates where we'd switch the license plates. They were all stolen cars, you know, or there were work cars in fictitious names, so on. And uh, Dickie uh, Gorman and Gino Chipetta and uh, Pauly Shiro went into this uh, tavern in Cicero. And I'm sitting at the curb in the car with it, with it running, and I started hearing bang, bang, bang. It sounded like maybe, it sounded like 50 shots, you know, probably wasn't that many. But when you're out there and you hear all these shots, you know what the hell's going on. The door flies open, these guys come running out, and they leap, they didn't open up the, the doors, they just leaped in the, in the windows. The windows were down. So I pull away from the curb, and as I pull away from the curb, uh, a couple of guys come running out of there and they're shooting. And the bullets going going through the windshield, and the into the car, and one of the bullets went right down the center of uh, Gino Chapetta's head, made a perfect part down the center of his head, and he screams, "I'm shot!" And he grabs his head. I said, "You'd be dead!" I yelled at him, "You'd be dead if you got shot in the head!" And I looked at the windshield, and I seen where the bullet went. So we took off out of it, and we got a little ways down the road, and we continued on to uh, the northwest side, where where we. Uh, we're from. And as we're coming down that way, we're on a side street, Malvina, in Chicago, and uh, we pick up a tail. Uh, a plain clothes cop car gets in back of us, and they put the siren on for us to pull over. And uh, I'm, I start lambing them down the street. And in the middle of the street, there's a car double parked. And it's right in front of Tony Spacho's house. So I'm blowing the horn as I'm coming up in the car, and, I, and according to what I heard later from Tony, he tells Joey Hanson, pull out of the way. These guys are lambing the cops, whoever they are. Get the car out of the road. So Joey pulls the car out of the road. We shoot past the car. We make a right. I jam on the brakes. Dickie and uh, Paulie lean out the back window, and they empty two clips out into the unmarked car as it made the corner, and the car... Nobody got shot in the car, but they panicked the cops, and they hit a, got a lamp pole. So we took off, and uh, of course there was bad intentions. I guess if any of the bullets would have hit him, it would have hit him. But at the time, we were just thinking of getting out of there, and we weren't caring about anybody's life. So uh, the following day, I ran into uh, Tony, and he said, I knew it was you guys. I knew it. He said, you guys are crazy. He said, you're going to wind up killing somebody, you're going to go to jail, this is crazy, this is cowboy shit, you got to stop what you're doing, he's I got a way, we can make money, well, before that, that day I seen him, Gino Chapetta quit, he said, that's it, I'm through, he was, this guy was like shattered, I mean, and he did have a perfect part on his head, and that was the end of him, so that left the three of us, so Tony wanted us to join forces with him, and at the time, Tony was like semi-connected to the outfit, to a guy by the name of James Tortorello and Milwaukee Phil and a few other guys. 
And I says, I hope this don't mean that we're connected to these guys. He's no, no, no. He says, I'll work with you and I'll work with them. So Tony had a new uh, source of robbery that we were going to commit, and uh, we started doing that with him.